Hello everyone and welcome back. Today is our final lecture. This will be our final exam lecture review. So again, how this works is I'll provide a term or concept and it is your job to try and regurgitate some information. Then we'll uh, review that term or concept and then uh, start with the next term or concept. Our first term is coccidioidomycosis. And feel free to pause these if you want to think a little bit more about them. We'll try and move a little bit quickly though through these. So work at it at your own pace. Okay, so this is what causes, uh, it's another name for it is Valley Fever or San Joaquin Fever. Um, it's caused by coccidioides emitis. It's fungal in origin, and it's transmitted through inhalation of airborne spores. This image here is an example of a 2001 outbreak, which was caused by inhalation of spores from a dinosaur dig. Okay, next term, otitis media and externa. Okay, so these are ear aches where we have the infection of the middle ear caused by a variety of bacteria or viruses. Pus builds up, puts pressure on the eardrum and causes inflammation. This is more common among children um, which have infections in their auditory tube that is smaller and more horizontal. Here is swimmer's ear, which is the infection of the external ear canal and uh, leading to the eardrum. And this one is often caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a bacterium. Pertussis or whooping cough. This one is called, caused by the bacterium Bordetella pertussis, and they attach to the ciliated cells in the trachea and release toxins that destroy the ciliated cells, which interferes with the ciliary escalator and allows mucus to flow toward the lungs instead of the stomach. Helicobacter pylori. Okay, so these are bacteria that can cause a, a peptic ulcer disease. They disrupt the layer of mucus that protects the stomach lining from acid and digestive enzymes. Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus aureus is um, the most pathogenic species of the genus Staphylococcus. It's found in the nasal passages of 20% of the population permanently and 60% transiently. Staphylococcus epidermis compromises 90% of the permanent skin microbiome and only pathogenic when the skin is broken. So it is considered an opportunistic pathogen. It is most common cause of biofilm-based infections on indwelling devices. So it's a really common source for nosocomial infections or hospital uh, um, sourced infections. Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is caused by a virus its transmission can be sexual, parenteral, or perinatal. It's similar to hepatitis A in its symptoms, such as appetite loss, nausea, diarrhea, fever, malaise, and jaundice. Uh, unlike hepatitis A, it is a chronic infection and can lead to liver cancer or liver cirrhosis. Like hepatitis A, there is a vaccine for hepatitis B. Um, 
While we're in the topic of AB, let's talk about C. Um, C can be spread through a parenteral route. It's really common uh, for those who use intravenous drugs. It's similar to HIV, but takes about 20 years for appearance and recognition of symptoms. And about 85% of cases do become chronic. And this actually kills more people in the US than HIV slash AIDS. And because there is a considerable amount of antigenic variation, it has uh, made it difficult to develop a vaccine for this. Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is caused by the bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea. In men, there's about a 20 to 35% chance of transmission per exposure. And it infects the urethra, causing painful urination and pus containing discharge from the urethra. In women, there is a higher 60 to 90% chance of transmission per exposure. And it can infect the cervix, often with few symptoms and lack of recognition can lead to later complications. Giardia intestinalis. This disease is caused by the protozoan parasite that causes, and it causes, uh, sorry, it causes uh, the di diarrheal disease, giardiasis. Uh, possesses an adhesive disc, which is used to attach to the intestinal wall and has multiple flagella. Atypical bacterial pneumonia. One of the major causative agents is Legionella pneumonophila, which causes uh, Legionellosis. This is non-communicable, but it is thought to be transmitted through water sources where it grows even when lowly chlorinated. So this could be uh, indoor waterfalls, uh, outdoor waterfalls, shower heads, things of that nature. Of course, the typical bacteria pneumonia is caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, a typical also includes Chlamydophila cytica, which causes psittacosis and is usually spread through contact with bird droppings. And lastly, Coxiella burnetii or Q fever. 60% uh, of cases are asymptomatic. Airborne transmission from a cattle reservoir um, can be uh, the source of this and it's endemic to the West Coast. Next is syphilis. Syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum, and there are several stages to this. The primary stage is uh, appearance of painless fluid filled sores at the site of infection, usually about three weeks post uh, exposure, and then they disappear within weeks. The second stage uh, has the appearance of highly infectious oral sores and skin slash mucous membrane rashes, especially in the palms and soles. Hair loss can occur, fever, and uh, rarely some neurological symptoms. The latent period is asymptomatic and non-contagious except congenitally, and it may last many years. And finally, the tertiary stage in which 25% of cases, the disease reappears as gumus, um, rubbery masses of tissue usually seen on skin and mucous membranes. Cholera. Cholera is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae, which is a curved rod with one flagellum. It colonizes the small intestine, it releases an exotoxin, which causes water and electrolytes to move out of the host cells. This can lead up to five gallons of fluid loss in one day, 
causing vis viscous blood, uh, low blood pressure and shock, and death. Untreated, the mortality is 50%, whereas with treatment, it's about 1%. Typhoid fever. It's caused by a special cerevar of Salmonella enterica, uh, cerevar typhi, abbreviated as shortened to S typhi. It's transmitted through the fecal oral route. And recovered persons can have lifelong immunity, but 1 to 3% are chronic asymptomatic carriers like typhoid Mary. Pelvic inflammatory disease. This is a catch-all term for the progressive infection of the female pelvic organs, including the uterus, cervix, and ovaries, which is usually caused by Neisseria gonorrhea or C. trachomatis. It can lead to salpingitis or infection of uterine tubes, and it is most severe is most severe form of PID. It can lead to scarring that can cause sterility and life-threatening ectopic pregnancies. Norovirus. Norovirus, similar to rotavirus, which can cause a fever, diarrhea, and vomiting for one week. One week. Uh, norovirus uh, also causes a vomiting or diarrhea for about two to three days, uh, but it's very contagious, has a very high R value, greater than 20 million cases annually in the U.S., with less than 300 deaths, and it is highly persistent on surfaces. Papilloma virus. This is a virus that causes warts um, on which are benign skin and mucous membrane growths. 90% of the cases resolve themselves within two years, but serotype 16 and 18 are implicated in cervical, oral, anal, and penile cancer. C. diff associated diarrhea. As the name indicates, it's caused by Clostridioides difficile. It's normally harmless and resident of the intestinal microbiome. Uh, overgrowth, though, caused by the use of antibiotic theory, therapy can lead to symptoms ranging from mild diarrhea to deadly inflammation of the colon. It can be treated with uh, narrow spectrum antibiotics specific to these, this bacterium or a fecal transplant to restore the normal microbiome. Scarlet fever. This is a streptococcal pharyngitis wherein lysogenized or broken cells of Streptococcus pyogenes produce an erythrogenic toxin. This leads to the uh, pinkish red skin rash that's present and the uh, trait of a spotted tongue that later becomes red and enlarged. It may also be linked to Streptococcal skin infections. Next up is ELISA. So there's quite a bit to talk about with ELISAs. ELISAs are uh, an abbreviated form of enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. They are assays done to check 
if a particular patient has antibodies for a type of pathogen or to detect the presence of a pathogen even. The way it works is there's a primary antibody, a secondary antibody, and a method for detection uh, linked to that secondary antibody. So in our example, we have in our lab, we had a primary antibody that binds to a, uh, an antigen. So this could be an antigen of some sort of disease. The primary antibodies were ascertained from the patient. So if the patient has been exposed to that pathogen before, then the patient should have antibodies against that pathogen. Those primary antibodies bind to the antigen and a secondary antibody, which uh, um, similar to how the primary binds to the antigen, the secondary antibody is made from animals by injecting primary antibodies into them. So this secondary antibody finds the primary antibody to be its target. It attaches itself to that and um, the secondary antibody comes with a enzyme hooked to it. And that enzyme uh, can be used to uh, create a color product to tell us if the patient um, is positive or not. So that's a lot to throw at you, but in an ELISA, secondary antibodies bind to primary antibodies, which bind to the antigens that we're trying to detect. And their labels make it easy for us to tell if they have bound. So none of this works unless the primary bot antibodies are present and they attach to the antigen. So that's really what we're testing for. And indirectly, that'll tell us if the patient has been exposed or not to that antigen. So let's get some visual images of how this looks. So um, you can ignore the references to uh, pages and, and whatnot in these figures, but just look at the images themselves. So in step number one, we have a well and we absorb or attach some sort of antigen to it. So this could be some HIV antigens or uh, some sort of an allergen that we want to see if someone has an allergy towards. It could be all sorts of things. An antigen is just something that an that a antibody finds as a target. Next, we add the patient's antiserum. Um, so on addition of this, if the patient has antibodies present, then the antibodies will bind to this antigen. And this is the primary antibody. Next, we add the, uh, the uh, secondary antibody. Oops, oh, sorry. And the secondary antibody is the second Y-shaped image, and its target is the primary antibody. Attached to this secondary antibody was an enzyme. And this enzyme, if this antibody attaches here, in the next step, if we add a substrate for that enzyme, it'll cause that enzyme to that. Sorry, I got cut off there for a little bit. But as I was saying, the secondary antibody is attached to an enzyme. And this enzyme upon the addition of a substrate, will change that substrate into a colored product. And so um, if that colored product is formed, it tells us that this enzyme-linked secondary antibody was able to attach to the primary antibody, which attached to the antigen. So if in this situation, the patient has this primary antibody, it tells us that the patient has been exposed to whatever that antigen is from, whether it's a virus, an allergen, or something else. And it also tells us that the patient formed an immune reaction to it. Okay, last one, point source spread. In epidemiology, a point source spread is a spread of a disease from a common source, a single source. And it occurs during a short period of time and has a high spike, it has a, a spike in cases that resolve themselves and return to a baseline level quickly. So in this image, 
in this uh, epi curve, as we call them. On the x-axis is the date. On the y-axis is the number of cases. And somewhere here in the mid part of October, there was a point source which uh, um, caused this disease to spread to uh, several patients. And so we have this rapid uh, incline in the number of cases and then a rapid decline after these cases resolve themselves, returning to some sort of a baseline thereafter. And then it looks like maybe even it's completely gone um, later on in November. So uh, that wraps up the final exam unit review. Please reach out to me if you have any questions at all about the exam or the material. I would love to go through it with you. Uh, thank you all so much for a wonderful semester and I wish you all the best.